Hey folks, when I think of analyzing microbial diversity from the diversity of microbiomes that we all study, I generally think of two different approaches. In the first approach, we take our sequence data and we assign them into bins, different categories, whether that be based on taxonomy or based on how similar those sequences are. Again, I call those bin-based statistics, and we measure things like richness, the number of types, Shannon diversity. We could also look at things like beta diversity, comparing uh, who's there and in what abundance. The second approach that I see people frequently using is what I call a phylogenetic approach. In that approach, instead of putting your sequences into bins, what we instead do is build phylogenetic trees from those sequences, and then we look at the structure, uh, the branch length, the, you know, the, the ordering of the tree to figure out what branch length is unique to one uh, sample or another. These give rise to things like measuring phylogenetic diversity, which we talked about in the last episode, as well as a suite of tools called Unifrac, Unifrac being uh, short for unique fraction. There are two approaches to Unifrac. The unweighted approach is a lot like a membership-based metric of beta diversity, like something called Jacquard. In Jacquard, uh, you can think of this as being like the MasterCard symbol, uh, where you've got a pool of uh, taxa from one community, another pool of taxa from another community, and you wanna see how much do those overlap, how many of the taxa are shared between the different communities. Again, we don't care about the abundance of those taxa, we just care about what taxa overlap. And again, that's what I think of as membership. And that unweighted unifrac allows us to measure the similarity or dissimilarity of our communities based on membership. The second approach to measuring beta diversity is what I call structure. This is based on the membership, but also based on the abundance of those taxa in those uh, bins. Uh, again, for thinking about something like a Bray-Curtis metric, we might incorporate something like, say, the relative abundance or the frequency that we see each taxa. In the phylogenetic approach, we'd use a method like the weighted unifrac, which is a lot like unweighted, except we're weighting uh, the branch length and the shared branch length or the unique branch length based on the frequency of that of that branch, of, of the individual that that branch is going out to. So again, these are two different approaches. As our data sets get larger and larger, I find that the phylogenetic approaches just become a lot less tractable because the process of building the tree is just really hard when you've got tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of sequences. Instead, the bin-based approaches are a lot more tractable uh, because you can use a classifier to put things into bins based on taxonomy and even you know methods like assigning sequences to operational taxonomic units, OTUs, are a lot easier. And so the question naturally arises, if I do a bin-based approach, does that cost me anything over using a phylogenetic approach? How different are the results? Also, we might think about, well, how different are the results if we do something based on membership versus something based on structure? Again, membership and structure are two different concepts, and so we might think that they should look a bit different, but do they? Um, and again, this process of looking at things based on bins or based on phylogeny is also an interesting question. So that's what I wanna do in today's episode. I've gone ahead and generated the unifrac based uh, distance matrices in mother, so outside of R here. Um, if you wanna get these data as well as all the data that I'll be working with and all the code that we've been working on over the past couple of months, um, you can go down below in the description. There's a link to a blog post with instructions on how to get caught up. I also have a little tutorial video here that will help you get going as well. So again, what I want to do is I want to compare the weighted and unweighted unifrac to distance matrices for the same data calculated using Jacquard as well as Bray-Curtis. So we'll have four distance matrices that we want to compare to each other. And the main tool that I wanna to use to compare these metrics to each other is something called the Mantel test. The Mantel test allows us to look at the correlation of different distance matrices. And that is another great tool coming to us from Vegan. So with my new R script, I'm gonna start with library uh, tidyverse as well as library um, vegan. So the first thing that I wanna do is review how we can generate the distance matrix for Bray Curtis and Jacquard. So as we've already seen, we can do read TSV, and then the data that I want is mice.shared, and that will read that in, and I can go ahead and then do a select for group OTU. We get a tibble out of reading that in and doing the select to only get the group name and those columns that correspond to our different bins. Again, it's a bin-based uh, representation of the data. I need this to be a data frame so that it can go into vegan to calculate the distance. So to do that, we'll do column uh, two row names and we'll use the group column to do that. 
And then we will then feed that into AVG dist. And the sample that we're gonna use uh, will be 1,804. So we'll get 1,804 sequences from all of the samples, calculate a Bray distance matrix, and we'll repeat that 100 times and then calculate the average. And then the D method that we'll use is Bray. This then gives me a warning message that there were about a dozen or so samples that were removed because they didn't have 1,804 sequences. Again, if you wanna learn all about this sampling depth issue, look back through the previous episodes in this uh, playlist. So now we need to convert this into a tibble so that we can use all our great dplyr and ggplot tools with it. It's currently stored as a distance matrix. And so to get it into a tibble, we need to do two steps. First, we need to do as.matrix. Uh, this will convert the distance matrix into a matrix. And then to get from a matrix into a tibble, we can do as underscore tibble. And then row names, uh, I'm gonna set to be equal to A. In the next step, we're gonna do a pivot longer where we'll take the column names of our matrix and make those another column that I'll call B because we'll have our row names in A and our column names in B and our distances in a column that I'll call Bray. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So we can do pivot longer uh, and we'll pivot longer everything except for A and then we'll do names uh, to uh, B and then values to uh, let's do Bray. And let's also go ahead and save this data frame to a variable that we'll call Bray Tibble, TBL. So we see that we've got columns A and B for the rows and columns of the matrix, as well as Bray for the actual distance. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this, and then we'll replace Bray with Jacquard uh, there and here. Uh, so the D method will be typed Jacquard, and values to here will be Jacquard. So now we have the distances for our structure as well as membership-based approaches. We now want to get the distances in from the distance matrices for the weighted and unweighted unifrax that I calculated outside of R in Mother. To do that, uh, we'll recall that way, way, way back, uh, we used a lot of base R functions to write a function to read in a phylop formatted distance matrix, which is exactly what we have here. So way back up here on line four, say, I'm going to run a command source uh, and we'll do code forward slash, and what we want is the read distance uh, file, read matrix, read matrix.r. So if we go ahead and run that, we now, if we look over in our environment tab, we see that we've got a read matrix function uh, in here, right? And so now we can use that to read in our matrices. So if I do read matrix, and I do data forward slash mice dot, uh, let's do the unweighted first, so unweighted AVE.dist, so that AVE is in the file name because again, this was calculated based on rarefaction, right? And so we basically calculated 100 unweighted unifrac distance matrices, sampling everything to 1,804 sequences, and then mother calculated the average, and that's what we've got here. So I forget what this actually has it read in as, so let's go ahead and pipe this to glimpse. And so we see that this is actually a vector. So if it had been a distance matrix, it would have sent dist here. So this is actually a matrix, 348 by 348. So we can go directly into uh, tibble now by doing as underscore tibble, and we'll do row names equals A, like we had done before. And again, we can do a pivot longer, uh, where we, again, I do everything but A. Our names two will be B, and then values two will be, uh, this is unweighted. And so now what we get is A, B, and unweighted. But something I'm noticing that's a little bit odd is that we have a lot of extra spaces to the right of each of the sample names. Um, I wonder if this is a product of how it was outputted from mother and that we have a bunch of these spaces. So what we'd like to do is strip out those spaces from A and B. So how do we do that? Well, if we wanna modify a column, remember that the function we need to use is called mutate. So we can pipe this into mutate. And what we could do would be to say like, let's take A, and we'll set that equal to str replace, and we'll take all the spaces, so we want all of them, so str replace all, so we'll place all cases of a space, uh, and we also need to give it a as the string, so we're gonna take a, find all the spaces, and replace it with nothing, and so now we see that that did get rid of all the spaces, right? So this is one way to do it, and this is kind of the way that's easiest for me to remember because I use str replace and str replace all the time. But something we might use instead of str replace all would be str trim. And what str trim will do is that that basically does this function, right? So we could do trim on a, and again, what we see is that it removes everything from a, 
And we could do the same thing uh, with B, right? So let's go ahead and copy this. And instead of A, we'll do B. And so now we see we get rid of all those extra spaces. So I'm gonna save this as a comment. And I'd like to show you another way, right? And so again, mutate, I use a lot um, like this, but there are other mutate functions that um, perhaps we're not as familiar with. So let's practice those just to get a chance to use them. And perhaps we don't need to write two lines. Maybe we can get away with only writing one line. So one mutate that we could do would be mutate at, right? And so we give mutate at the columns that we want to mutate, right? So we could do A and B, and then we're gonna say at A and B, what we want to do is run str trim. And again, we see that that worked, right? So that works well. But say you had a whole bunch of columns that you wanted to trim all the white space on, this might be a bit painful. So another approach that we might try would be mutate if. So what we could do is is.character. And so what that's going to say is if this column is of type character, then we want to change the column by running the str trim function on that column. Again, we get the same output. So again, these are three different ways to do the same thing of trimming out uh, the extra white space at the end of our sample names here, right? So I'll go ahead and save this as unweighted uh, so that we can compare it to Bray and Jacquard. And I'm going to copy this down as well and we'll remove the un uh, so we can have a weighted version as well, right? So we change the file name, change the values too, and I think everything should be good there, right? And so now we have weighted, great. And so now we have Bray, Jacquard, unweighted, and weighted. And we want to combine those all together. And we've seen this a lot by now. Uh, we can do inner join. We'll do Bray, TBL, Jacquard, TBL. Uh, and I'm remembering that actually I named these weighted and unweighted without the TBL. Let's go ahead and put those on for now. Uh, yeah. And weighted TBL by uh, A and B. So this will combine the data frames by matching up the sample names that are in the A and B columns, right? And so now we can see we've got A, B, Bray, and Jacquard. And we'll repeat this uh, two more steps uh, with what's coming through the pipeline, as well as unweighted TBL. And again, we'll do by uh, A and B. And we'll repeat this again uh, to get the weighted, right? And so now we have our samples in A and B and our four different approaches to calculating uh, those beta diversity metrics. So let's go ahead and save this to a variable we'll call combined. So let's make some plots now to compare the four different metrics of looking at uh, the beta diversity, right? And so again, we can take combined and we can pipe that and we want to get into ggplot, but our matrix is currently square, right? We have we have you know F3D0 compared to F3D1, but we also have F3D1 combined, compared to F3D0. So let's go ahead and do a filter for A less than B. So we're only looking at things below the diagonal. Uh, and also we're not looking at that self comparison of F3D0, F3D0, right? And so we can then pipe that to ggplot AES. And so let's put on the X axis for now. Let's go ahead and do Bray. And on the Y, let's do weighted. So these are the two structure based metrics. And we'll then do a geom point. And let's do geom smooth. And I'm going to go ahead and put in se equals false to get rid of the cloud, if you will, around the line through the fit. And we see a pretty linear fit to the data. Uh, we've got our break curtis distances on the x-axis and the weighted on the y-axis. And you can see that as we kind of increase the distance between samples by Bray curtis by that bin-based approach, the weighted also go up. What's interesting to me is that at a distance of one by Bray Curtis, so where there's no OTUs shared between the different samples, we still get a weighted unifrag value that's less than one. And again, that's because the weighted approach is a phylogenetic approach that takes into account the relatedness between the different sequences. So the weighted makes things look a little bit more similar than the Bray Curtis does, which is interesting, right? So let's go ahead and copy this. And now let's look at our membership-based statistics. So we'll do Jacquard and we'll do unweighted. And that looks a bit different. <laughs> and so we mostly see a bit of a you know positive trend, right? Um, and so again, as we increase Jacquard, we see un increased unweighted. 
Um, again, like we saw with Bray versus Weighted, uh, that the card distances, the bin base distance can be larger than the phylogenetic uh, distance. Um, this isn't perfect, right? We see some kind of funkiness going on. Also, there's something weird going on here as well. Uh, at a very low jacquard level, we see um, you know, a moderate uh, unweighted unifrac value. But again, there is a positive correlation between these two different ecological metrics. Something else we could perhaps think about doing would be to com compare uh, jacquard to Bray. So again, these are both bin-based statistics and the jacquard being the membership and Bray being the structure. And what we see here is a really smooth fit between jacquard and Bray. Uh, it's not a perfect uh, linear relationship, but at the same time, it's a pretty good uh, consistent trend, which I find to be really interesting since jacquard has no abundance information in it uh, that we see such a tight correlation with the Bray-Curtis distances. That's, that's pretty cool. So let's repeat this and then do the same type of thing, but looking at the unifrac. So on the X, I'll put the unweighted, and on the Y, I'll put weighted. So here we see the scatter plot for comparing the unweighted distances to the weighted distances. Uh, it's not as clean of a correlation as we saw with Jacquard and Bray Curtis, but it still looks pretty linear and pretty strong uh, in a positive direction. Okay, so again, this is a visual way of looking at the data. What I'd like to share with you now is how can we get the mathematical correlation using a test called the Mantell test. The Mantell test is a test that you can use to compare different distance matrices. Here I'm using different beta diversity metrics, but you could also take say a beta diversity matrix as well as some type of environmental matrix. Say you had a matrix uh, comparing the similarity of a community um, chemically, right? You could compare that chemically based matrix to the ecologically based matrix and see if there's any correlation between the two matrices. It's effectively like doing a correlation test like a Spearman or Pearson correlation, but it does some special things for assessing whether or not the correlation is statistically significant. There's a function called Mantel in the vegan package that we'll be using. The input to Mantel are two distance matrices. So we need to extract from our combined data frame our distance matrices that we can then feed into the Mantel test. So let's go ahead and make those. So we'll start with uh, the braid Curtis. So we'll do combined and let's do select A and B and Bray. And so again, we get those three columns and we can then of course do pivot wider um, names from equals B values from equals Bray. Again, we get the wide data frame. Then we can do column to row names with A. Again, that gets us a matrix, but we need a distance matrix. So we'll pipe this to as.dist. And this then gets us a lower triangular uh, distance matrix. And so I will then call this Bray uh, dist. And we can now repeat this for our four other distance matrices. So we'll do jacquard on that, and then we'll extract the jacquard column, and we'll use values from jacquard. All right, and then we'll do it again, but for unweighted dist, uh, and let's copy that name so I don't have to type it over and over again. All right, so then we've got our unweighted, and now we can do our weighted, and we'll do the same thing, except we'll remove that un. Great, and let me just double check that I ran all these. Great, and so we now have our four distance matrices loaded into R, and we can now do the Mantel test. So we can do Mantel with, let's do uh, Bray dist, and let's do weighted uh, dist. So the Mantel test expects the input to be two distance matrices. Not two matrices, but two distance matrices. I've been burned by this in the past, and so I don't want you to be burned by that. So if you give it a matrix rather than a distance matrix, it's gonna calculate the distances from your matrix. So if you give a distance matrix, it won't do that. All right, so here's the output. Um, what we're interested in is this Mantel statistic R, and so we see a value of 0.8734. Uh, that is clearly significant. By default, it uses a Pearson uh, statistic correlation. So if you wanted to use the Spearman, as we've seen in other episodes, you could do method equals uh, Spearman. And again, this gives us a fairly similar correlation value. If I wanna get out that value, one thing I could do would be to say, let's take the last value and we could pipe that into glimpse. 
And this then gives us the structure of the list object being generated by the mantel function. And so the value we want is statistic. So again, I could put on this statistic and we get back that 0.824458. Very good. So let's go ahead and copy this down a few times. And I want to get the um, weighted dist and the unweighted dist. So we'll do weighted and unweighted. And then we also want to do Bray and Jacquard. And then I also want to do Jacquard and unweighted, right? So those are the four main comparisons we want. So let's go ahead and run all these and see what we get for our different correlation statistics. All right, so it ran through those. Uh, the mantel function does take a little bit longer to run than like core.test. And that's because it's doing a permutation based test uh, to calculate the p-value for each of these uh, correlation values. I think these correlation values are frankly so large that it's obvious that they're significantly different from zero. So you could probably, you know, run core.test on it anyway, and you'd get the same result. But, you know, I want to show you how you can use the Mantel test. And so here we are, right? So again, if we compare Bray, the bin-based method, to the weighted Unifrac, the phylogenetic approach, we see a correlation of about 0.82. So that's pretty good, right? Uh, weighted versus unweighted, correlation of about 0.53. If we look at Bray versus Jacquard, so comparing the membership and structure-based approaches using bin-based statistics, we get a correlation of basically one, right? That's basically what we would have expected when we saw that you know very smooth curve. And then if we compare Jacquard to the unweighted, so the two membership-based metrics uh, by bin and phylogenetic approaches, we get a correlation of about 0.41. So that's less than what we saw between weighted and unweighted unifrac. As I pointed out in the last episode, I have yet to have a case where if I compared a bin-based approach to a phylogenetic approach that I got different results. These results here from these Mantel tests certainly bear that out. Of course, what I'm looking at here is one data set from a mouse study. It might be different for your soil study or marine system or human system or, or whatever, right? Um, but what I would encourage you to do is that if you can, you know, try this and see if it works out. At the same time, if you can try it with the phylogenetic approach, then that means you can build a phylogenetic tree. So you may as well report those phylogenetic results alongside the bin-based methods. But if you can't, right, because your data set is too large to build a tree, uh, then have some confidence that you probably wouldn't have seen an example where uh, the bin-based method gave you a different result from the structure-based method. Where I might see a difference is perhaps between the membership and the structure-based analyses, right? So the mouse samples that I'm working with here are pretty similar because again, it's a time course of a bunch of mice that were all living together. They're kind of clonal, right? I could imagine a case where if say you're looking at soils collected all over the United States or all over the world, that structure and membership might not be such a one-to-one -one correlation like we saw here. As always, think deeply about what you are measuring and the types of questions you're trying to answer and make sure that your metrics are doing that for you, right? Don't do a whole bunch of beta diversity metrics looking for a significant p-value by, you know, looking at Adonis. Uh, pick the metric first and then do the test. If you're doing all the distances and then the tests, you're really p-hacking and that's really, unfortunately, just inappropriate for uh, an approach to studying microbial communities. Well, I hope you found this interesting. Keep practicing with this. As always, please try this with your own data. Let me know if you get a result that's different than what I've got. And we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.